which um, mainly just has pictures of the herbs I'm going to be talking about just to kind of bring this to life a little bit and show you some of the herbs that you might not be so familiar with. Um, And I promise it's not a PowerPoint covered with lots of text, so it shouldn't be too painful for this evening. Um, If you want to, you can introduce yourself in the chat, say hi, maybe where you're from, um, or you can just sit tight. And feel free, I'll I'll kind of, I'll keep my eye on the chat box um, as we go through. So if you have questions um, or comments um, or anything to add, please feel free to write in there. And we'll have kind of some time um, at the end um, to kind of, yeah, if you want to kind of um, verbalize your question or chat or have a question, we can do that um, as well. So I'm just going to get this up and running. So um, just as a little introduction for those of you who might not be um, so familiar with Hackney Herbal, we um, started as a project back in 2015 um, out of a community garden on Mare Street in Hackney, which is East London for any of you who might not be in London. Um, And our mission since the kind of very beginning has been around promoting well-being using herbs. So a huge kind of part of our work is running workshops and courses and events which show people um, how to grow herbs, how to identify herbs in the wild and how to kind of harness the um, kind of numerous properties and benefits that they can have for our health and well-being. And when we started, um, we kind of started off by growing lots of herbs and making teas that we would sell to fundraise for our kind of free program of events and um, community projects. So we still do that, um, but we also kind of um, run a lot more events now and our kind of the educational side of things is um, probably about kind of 80, 90% what we spend our time doing. And all our kind of workshops and things um, and the tea that we sell, all the money from that goes back into running free community activities. So we work um, in partnership with a number of Hackney based organisations and a lot of our courses are are kind of um, open and are accessible to people who are referred through a number of different mental health networks. So drawing on kind of the benefits of people taking some time out in nature, uh, meeting others if they're a little bit socially isolated and learning kind of many different ways that you can use kind of plants and nature to improve your well-being. So these are just some pictures just giving you a little flavour of what we do. Normally, kind of pre-COVID times, we also run lots of kind of free public events in different areas around Hackney. Um, But over the last few months, we've kind of we've been doing a lot of that online. And in the last kind of couple of years, um, oh, there was another picture there. We've moved into a garden space, which is in Hackney Wick over in East London, kind of the very east of Hackney. And from there, we we run kind of volunteer sessions. Um, we run a lot of our courses normally from there. And again, kind of creating a space um, where people and nature and wildlife can all thrive together. Um, so the topic for today is all around winter well-being. And I'm going to kind of be talking you through... Um, a number of different herbs that you can use to support your health. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about herbs for helping to kind of um, support our immune systems, keep us kind of healthy, um, things that can be supportive to us as the seasons change and as the weather kind of changes. Uh, I'm also going to talk about a few herbs we can have if we do kind of fall sick. So simple things you can have for coughs and colds and flus and things. And um, also a few herbs for... Um, stress and for sleep Um, so times we live in can be a little bit stressful Um, sleep can also sometimes well sleep can often play a really huge role in our overall health and particularly our immune kind of health so I'll be kind of touching on some of those things Um, and for any of you that might already know a little bit about herbs or have a bit of a herbal practice um, you'll already know that Um, Many herbs have kind of many different properties, so um, they're not as simple as having kind of um, one herb for each thing. Each herb actually does a number of different things. So I'll kind of be touching on um, kind of the 
um, yeah, kind of broad nature of some of their actions. So um, I'm going to start with this one, which is kind of probably one of the most supportive things you can have for your immune system. And um, this is something that we use the, the flowers and the stems and also the root of the plant, um, commonly known as echinacea. Um, and something that uh, has been used kind of for a really long time by um, Native Americans. So very kind of sacred plant to them. Um, a lot of the knowledge that we have um, about echinacea comes um, from their practices. And they would use this for a whole host of things, whether it was for um, snake bites or inflammation or um, fungal infections. Um, today, kind of in the West, we most commonly use it for the immune system. So it's very kind of stimulating to our immune system and has been proven in kind of um, various kind of clinical studies to shorten the duration of a cold or a flu. So you can kind of take this um, either preventatively. So it's quite a good one to have if you're someone who um, is quite susceptible to colds or if you're feeling quite burnt out and quite run down um, and maybe not able to be as healthy as you'd like to be as a way to just give your body a little helping hand. So um, kind of take, yeah, take it preventively. It can help to reduce your susceptibility to colds and flus, but you can also take it once you fall sick to kind of help with the symptoms, um, but also just to help your body's natural process of um, defense. So um, you can have this as a tea, um, as a, you can use the dried herb, or for a kind of stronger dose, you can use the tincture, which is, an extraction that's made um, by soaking the herb in alcohol. And that just gives you um, a, yeah, a much stronger medicine and you take um, little drops of it um, kind of daily. Um, it's also a really nice um, herb for wildlife. Um, pollinators and bees really like the flowers. And its name um, comes from the Greek word echinos, um, which means hedgehog. So you can kind of see in the flower, it's a bit clearer once the flowers have dried, you get these kind of spiky, um, spiky flower heads um, that look a bit like hedgehogs, uh, sometimes also called um, cone flowers. And they're also, you might have seen them if you've kind of visited gardens and things, or if you, if you garden at home, they're also um, grown quite commonly as just like an ornamental plant. Um, then something that you've probably seen or you might have seen if you've um, spent any of the last few months going out for walks and things and had a bit more time to um, maybe investigate some of the wild areas around where you live. Um, but also you can find this growing everywhere in urban spaces as well. Um, so the elder tree and it gives us two different medicines at two different times in the year. So Normally, um, kind of mid to late spring, we will harvest the flowers, which are on the left. So these little creamy, um, creamy white flowers and traditionally make things like cordials or syrups. Um, you can also use the dried herb and the flowers are really nice for coughs and for colds. And there's something called um, an expectorant which basically means that they help the um, they help our respiratory system to get rid of mucus and phlegm, basically. So if you've got really strong symptoms from whether it's cold or fluy or you're really congested and you've got a lot of kind of heaviness in your sinus, um, elderflower is a really lovely thing to have. And a kind of um, sort of well-known kind of herbalist go-to tea blend for colds and coughs and flus is to mix um, peppermint with elderflower and something called yarrow, which I'm going to talk about um, as well. And that's a really nice thing to have when you're feeling a bit poorly and a bit under the weather. And the, the kind of elder as a tree is something that's been regarded as um, sort of has this nickname of medicine cabinet of the people. So it's a uh, a herb and a tree that's sort of used for many, many different things. Um, not so much now, but if you're someone who um, suffers from hay fever, 
um, or kind of other allergies during spring and summer. Elderflower is also a really nice thing to have for that. Um, so you can start having having a tea from the elderflowers maybe around March time, um, and that will kind of help you to be more to be less susceptible to um, pollen in later spring and summer. Um, and then provided that um, people haven't picked all the flowers um, from the trees and have done um, foraging in a mindful way, um, in the autumn time, the tree will produce its berries, so its fruit. And this seems to be getting kind of earlier and earlier each year. So I think in London this year, um, the elderberries were pretty much gone by the end of August, maybe the beginning of September. Um, and these are a really nice thing to have, um, again, for your immune system. And they're packed with vitamin C. They're also packed with antioxidants. And they make a really nice syrup. So um, a nice thing that we can do with lots of kind of the autumnal fruits um, is to make a really simple sugar syrup. Um, I'll share probably some of a link with some of the recipes for these um, things on. But you basically make up a sugar syrup and then kind of boil up your herbs um, with that. And you do use quite a lot of sugar, um, but it, it basically acts as a preservative um, for the elderberries if you want to make use of them fresh. Um, also, you can also, if you wanted to, you could buy the dried berries um, and make a really strong tea from them. So those are two really nice um, nice kind of things that we harvest from the elder tree um, and something that is probably depending on when you are it's probably a bit late for the berries now um, but I'm gonna I'll also share with you a couple of places where you can source um, all these different herbs from um, online. Um, so another thing that so this is something that you will still be able to find out in the wild and be able to go and forage for if you can get out and about. Um, and these are rose hips. So every type of rose plant will produce these as their fruit. And the ones that you tend to find growing in the wild um, is uh, the rosa canina, which is sometimes um, referred to as the dog rose. So they make these little um, bright red fruits and you can find these kind of in hedgerows or um, sometimes along river sort of riversides along kind of country roads um, as well as in kind of more um, sort of less um, maintained or slightly wilder urban spaces so for us in Hackney we have loads of these on Hackney Marsh um, as well as kind of along the canals and in a number of the um, more kind of wild parks and green spaces and it's quite good to pick them when they've already gone a little bit soft. Um, they just kind of have, they're a bit sweeter then and they're a little bit easier to um, cook down into a tea or into a syrup. And again, they're kind of packed with um, vitamin C um, and lots of antioxidants and a really kind of um, nice thing to have through the kind of autumn winter transition. Um, if you do kind of go picking, go foraging, um, it's good to be kind of just quite mindful about other people or other wildlife that also want to pick these um, or wildlife that kind of depend um, on these as kind of important food supply. So um, it's good to kind of go for a long walk um, and just take a few from each plant that you come across. And if a plant already looks quite depleted, uh, maybe find one which um, has got more of abundant supply. Um, there's a kind of a saying which sort of says, um, particularly for when you're harvesting rose hips, that um, when the plant pricks you, it's probably time to move on. <laughs> so you have to also be mindful of the um, quite sharp thorns on, on this plant. Um, so again, this is something that you can kind of cook up to make a really strong tea, um, or you can make a syrup. Um, so you can make quite a nice spicy syrup by boiling these up with um, any of your favorite spices. So I quite like using things like cinnamon um, and lots of ginger um, and things like kind of cloves. And you make a really kind of spicy, fruity syrup, which again is something really nice to have as a preventative. So something that you can have a spoonful kind of every few days um, or something quite nice to have if you do um, feel a bit poorly or you fall sick and um, to have a quite nice sort of warm, um, comforting, uh, drink. Uh, 
Um, and then this, which is just common sage. Um, so the same sage that you would kind of cook with. Um, and this is a really lovely herb to have if you've got a sore throat. So um, it's a plant that's kind of has really high um, levels of oil. And um, a lot of the oils kind of contain the properties that make sage um, antibacterial, antifungal, antiseptic, antimicrobial, antiviral. Um, and all of those things, all plants kind of have a certain amount of those things as part of their sort of own defense mechanism. Um, but some plants have um, very high levels. So it's really kind of supportive to our own immune system and kind of helping um, when we're trying to fight, whether it's um, an infection or um, bacteria or something. So um, having a cup of sage tea just on its own is quite um savory and quite savory um sometimes tastes a bit like drinking sausages which is maybe not always so appealing so appealing um so i quite like when i have um sage tea i often mix it with um things like honey and ginger maybe some lemon and that makes a really nice um drink even if actually you don't have a sore throat or if you're not sick um, that's actually quite a nice drink in its own right um and it's a very drying plant. So if you have a cup of sage tea, you'll probably notice that your mouth goes kind of completely dry. And that's kind of one way that it helps with um, sort of cold and flu symptoms. So again, if, you're, if you've got a really runny nose or your eyes are kind of streaming, um, it can help just to um, kind of alleviate some of those symptoms, um, particularly if you're sick and you kind of need to carry on um, with work or just life or whatever, um, it can just give you a little bit of a help with that. Um, and another way that you can use it, so in that kind of drying process, it's good for feverish conditions, um, also good for night sweats, um, and also good for menopause, so good for kind of hot flushes. Um, kind of all drawing on that very kind of drying um, action that it has. Um, and you can just use kind of the same sage that you might have already as a dried um, herb that you cook with. Um, or if any of you happen to be growing any of these things, you could use the fresh, fresh herb as well. Um, so here's another one that, again, you may have seen um, if you've been going on lots of walks. So this is something called yarrow. And it's a herb that we find growing quite commonly in any kind of grassy areas. So it grows in meadows. Um, it grows around grass, around buildings and housing blocks and things. Anywhere um, where anywhere that doesn't get mowed, um, you'll find it flowering sort of throughout the summer. Um, there's still there's still kind of it's still flowering um, around where we are now, kind of in some of the green spaces. Um, and it has these kind of um, kind of umbel shaped white kind of creamy flowers. And you can see the leaves are kind of um, I always think they look a bit like pondweed, but they have these very kind of like feathery, feathery leaves. So even if it doesn't flower, if you look kind of closely in grass next time you're kind of out and about, um, sort of more wild grass as opposed to a manicured lawn, um, you'll probably see some of these kind of feathery leaves growing. And um, it's quite a nice herb to look at in terms of its botanical name. So I've given you kind of the common name and then the um, botanical name that either comes from Latin or Greek. And that name will always give you some indication about the herb in terms of its properties, um, could be the way that it grows, its color or its size, um, what part of the world it's from. And um, for this one, millifolium means um, a thousand leaves. And it's kind of relating to these little, um, the kind of the structure of the leaves and all these kind of mini leaves that come off from the main stem. And um, we can use kind of the, again, we use the whole, whole part of this plant. So the leaves and the stems and the flowers. And it's a really nice thing to have for um, fevers and for colds. So I kind of mentioned before, you can mix this um, into a tea blend with peppermint and elderflower and just use, you kind of use um, like one spoonful of each. And it makes a really lovely herb um, for kind of, yeah, colds and flus. 
And it's technically um, classed as a bitter herb. So it also has an effect on our digestive system. So it can be good for kind of stimulating um, your digestion. Um, and there's quite a lot of folklore surrounding this. So the other kind of um, sort of common use for this herb is to help heal wounds. And you can kind of see from its name. So Achillea comes from Achilles, um, the kind of war hero. And um, there are kind of a couple of stories. So the sort of legend goes that Achilles would carry this herb with him into battle and then would use it to treat fallen soldiers. And the way that it works is it's um, it's a very astringent herb. So when you apply it directly to your skin, it kind of tightens tightens the skin. Um, and it helps to, if you've got a little cut or a graze, it helps to staunch the blood. So it kind of helps with the, the early stages of a wound healing. And it's also kind of regarded as a protective charm. And um, the other kind of story goes that um, when Achilles was a baby, his mother would bathe him in a bath of yarrow as a way to protect him. And she kind of, in the bath, she held him back by his ankles. And um, that's where we have this idea of um, Achilles' heel being sort of a, a point of weakness. Um, so some of you might know, if you know the stories of Achilles, um, that he was killed by an arrow in his ankle. Um, so it's sort of believed that, that his ankles were the only bit that didn't get the, the yarrow bath. So it were kind of where his, um, where his weakness was. Um, so yeah, you can, you might be able to find this, um, if you're going out and about for walks and things, you might still find it flowering, you might find it looking like this, but kind of brown and dried. Um, but it's something that you can make use, um, make use of in a nice kind of comforting tea for sort of, yeah, colds and flus and sniffs, sniffs and things. Okay, uh, maybe something slightly less common or more unusual um, is this, which is marshmallow. And um, this is a really lovely plant for softening and soothing. And Althea in its kind of botanical name um, basically means to heal. And it's something that kind of um, dates back to being used by the ancient Egyptians. Um, who would use sort of the, the root of the plant, which you can see on the right, um, to make um, cough remedies. Um, and one of the, the thing that it contains, which makes it really soothing, is something called mucilage, which is basically this um, kind of sticky, like gelatinous -y stuff, which um, all plants contain, but some plants have a lot more of it. And that kind of um, sticky substance is really nice for soothing um, the respiratory system. So if you've got a sore throat or if you've got a chesty cough, um, you can use it for that. It's also used for um, other conditions like bronchitis. Um, you can also have it for soothing the digestive system um, and a really nice thing, nice kind of um, herbal thing for um, acid reflux. Um, which can sometimes be a problem over the winter months when we tend to eat a little bit more than we should maybe. Um, and you can use the whole plant. Um, so we use the flowers and the leaves and the, the part, the, the roots of the plant is where a lot of that um, mucilage stuff is concentrated. So if you were using the, the leaves and the flowers, you could just make a, um, a hot infusion or a tea from those. Um, but if you wanted a really like a stronger effect, um, you can get hold of the dried root and um, instead of making a hot tea, the, the kind of the best way to extract that gloopy stuff is to soak the root um, in water overnight. And you'll find that kind of the water goes quite thick um, and then you can just strain out the, um, the marshmallow and then just have that as a, um, a cold drink. So really good for kind of chesty coughs, um, kind of, yeah, sore throats, um, upset tummies and things. Um, you can also use it. We sometimes make an infused oil from this herb and use that um, on the skin. 
Um, so yeah, a herb that you can kind of use in many, many different ways. And it was kind of, um, the herb that sort of inspired the marshmallow sweets that we have today. Um, so again, something that was kind of done over in the East and, um, I think then the French kind of took that and eventually the, the herb was removed and loads more sugar was added um, to, to what we have today as marshmallow sweets. Um, but you can kind of see here the, I think the reason why marshmallow sweets are often white and pink um, is because they've kind of kept that, they've been somewhat inspired by the flowers, which are these lovely little pinkish white, white things. Um, so here's one that probably, uh, I imagine a lot of you are probably quite familiar with and probably had before, um, is chamomile. And this is a, again, a nice example of a herb that you can use in lots and lots of different ways. So, um, it's a bitter herb, um, which means that it works on our digestive system. Um, and it's particularly kind of calming to the digestive system. So it's really good if you've had an upset tummy or if you've had any kind of like food poisoning or if you've um, like eaten something that you've kind of been maybe a little bit intolerant to or you've had like a dodgy takeaway or something. Um, it can be really nice for um, just relieving some of that discomfort. Um, it's also a sedative. So really, really kind of calming um, and really supportive to our nervous system. So it's quite a nice one to have um, at the end of the day, um, just to kind of unwind, um, to kind of help your digestion after dinner, um, but also to um, start to kind of help you, um, help your body unwind um, when you're getting ready for bed and to go to sleep. Um, it can be like a taste that can sort of divide people um, sometimes chamomile can be kind of really musty and, and um, it's a bit too heavy. A lot of the kind of chamomile tea that you buy in the shops is um, is just, yeah, quite strong and a bit overpowering. Um, but if you if you do kind of buy the herbs individually, um, it's quite nice to mix chamomile with something and then you can balance some of its kind of very strong flavours. Um, the other nice thing that you can do with chamomile um, is to put it in the bath. So um, if you've got the tea bags, you can just throw a couple of tea bags into the bath. And it's really, um, it's a really nice thing for the skin. So it sort of works as an anti-inflammatory. So it's kind of good for irritation, um, good for any kind of swelling that you have. Um, but really nice as a way to kind of, again, it's something that's really nice that kind of relaxes you in the evening. Um, also good for children if you if you have children or if you know people who've got kids um, that are quite active at night time and struggle to kind of get to sleep, then um, making them a chamomile bath can be a nice kind of supportive thing um, just to calm them down a little bit. Um, but yeah, a really nice thing kind of um, to have kind of for the mind, but also kind of for the body that you can just add into the bath quite easily. Um, so another nice um, sedative herb um, for the nervous system and kind of um, good one for relaxation is lemon balm. And this is something that you can have. Um, I quite like having lemon balm during the day. So it's a sedative, but it's not, um, you know, if you have a, if you have some lemon balm tea during the day, you're not going to suddenly um, fall asleep kind of in the midst of doing stuff. Um, it's quite an uplifting sedative. So it's, it's um, yeah, something that you can have during the day as well as in the evening. And um, it's a really nice antidepressant herb. So um, gets used a lot for things like anxiety, um, things like depression. And it's also a really nice herb to use as a base um, when you're mixing other herbs together. So um, towards the end, I'm going to give you just a few examples of some tea blends that you can try out if you want to go away um, and get some herbs and kind of mix them together to make your own blends. And I always feel like really mean describing lemon balm as like a filler herb, but um, because it's a great herb in its own right. But it does work quite well as a base because it's got quite a subtle taste. Um, it's quite sort of just mildly kind of lemony and sweet. So it works quite well to balance some of the other um, 
more bitter herbs or some of the other kind of savory herbs and just yeah blends well with a lot of the herbs that we tend to work with um it's also um an antiviral and um has had sort of various tests show that um it's also effective against the cold sore virus so um if you wanted to make use of it in that way um you can use the essential oil and kind of add a few drops of that into if you've already got like a cream or something um, or if you're making a balm um, you can use the essential oil as a, a kind of natural remedy for the cold sore virus um and yeah it's a really nice one you can try it on its own um it's also a herb that you can sort of more during the spring and summer get away with growing indoors on a sunny windowsill if you don't have any outdoor space um and kind of looking at its name melissa um it's basically a herb that has quite a strong connection with bees so um the kind of the the root of the word melissa that it's kind of it's been named after is linked to um kind of things like miel which is like honey and um some in the in the past but some beekeepers still do this as a kind of old tradition um when you set up a new beehive um some people will use um lemon balm whether it's fresh or um dried to kind of um almost wipe the inside of the hive out um and it's said to kind of just calm calm down the bees a little bit um but it's also a plant when you if you've grow this or if you see it growing um when it flowers it's the the bees are kind of all over it so it's really loved by um by the bees so again another nice herb to grow for wildlife as well um so another one so we're kind of in the sort of um stress busting section um of the talk so this is one that you may have seen growing um up people's fences um it's a climbing plant so it tends to kind of scramble and grow um to cover a wall um sometimes kind of tumbling over people's um, front gardens and back gardens and things and it's the plant that we get passion fruit from um the kind of varieties that we grow in the uk are slightly different so they kind of they you may have seen them they produce these little like orange fruits so different to the kind of um more kind of tropical passion fruits that we would import um, from kind of hotter climates, warmer climates. Um, so there's lots of different varieties. And this is um, a really nice herb to, again, that you can use for stress um, and for sleep. And um, it's another nice um, sedative. So it can be good for um, anxiety and for stress, um, for kind of nervous tension, um and it's also analgesic so it has a pain um, pain relief element to it so if you're someone who um finds that like often in the cold a lot of our old injuries or niggles or joints or whatever it is kind of can sometimes flare up in cold weather and damp weather and give us a lot of discomfort um so this is a really nice thing to have for that particularly if it, if that kind of pain is also affecting your sleep pattern um it's also something that um you can give to children so it's kind of um also been used for things like um hyperactivity or hypersensitivity in um children um it's also sometimes used to treat um tremors in parkinson's disease um and is another another plant actually that's used quite commonly by um native americans so they um have this nickname maypop for the plant um and it's also um again in kind of various different sort of clinical studies and tests um been shown to reduce gaba in your brain which is a type of acid um and that basically can help to reduce your brain activity so it kind of um helps to calm you down basically so it can also be good if you're um if if you find that um you struggle to sleep because you're like your brain is still quite active or you've got a lot of thoughts running through your brain brain um if you find it hard to switch off this can be a really nice one to try um and it's also a heart tonic so also kind of can be used for things like emotional upsets um, or emotional pain 
um, as well as more kind of physical sort of nerve pain. Um, so yeah, it's a really lovely one to try. I kind of, if you haven't had this before, um, I kind of encourage you to, to try it. Um, it has quite a nice sort of, um, sweet kind of grassy taste to it, but it's quite, um, it's quite a comforting, comforting one to have. Um, and the kind of the passion flower. Um, so the name kind of comes from the, um, I always get this wrong, but it basically comes from the structure of the flower. So there's this sort of um, cross sort of resembling sort of the crucifix in the flower. Um, and then um, this is the bit that I always forget. Um, it has 10 or 12, however many disciples there were, it has those kind of around the outside of the flower. 10 or 12. Someone, some, someone can put it in the chat if they know what it is. Maybe 12. Um, so, yeah, and for this, we actually, as beautiful as they are, we don't really use the flowers. Um, we tend to just use the leaves and the stems um, of this plant, of this one. Um, okay, so another kind of, again, another really nice um, plant that we use in many different ways, really nice edible herb as well, um, and really kind of nutritive plant. So... Um, from kind of having things like porridge <laughs> from the oats so it's the same, same plant that we use to make oats um, and have porridge and things and the oat straw is kind of the chopped up um, kind of um, ten we tend to kind of use the flowering tops and the stalks of this and um, this is kind of something that is really really nice to have if you're someone who's been under um, prolonged period of stress um, if you're burnt out um, if you're prone to burn burnout, um, and if you're kind of also if you're if you yeah if you kind of know that you're just going to be in a period of stress and there's not much you can kind of do um, to alleviate that. So whether it's yeah family things or work or things where you just know it's going to be a bit stressful, um, and it kind of it really works to help our bodies repair nerve damage. Um, particularly kind of um, from our emotional side. Um, so again, when we've been under pressure um, or under kind of prolonged periods of stress, um, it's really uplifting. So it's another example of an antidepressant herb um, and is again, just very kind of comforting to drink. So again, it's sort of this like um, almost kind of grassy sort of sweet, sweet hay type taste. Um, and it's really nice to combine with um, things like lemon balm and with chamomile to make a, a really nice kind of um, sort of restorative tea. So you could also use it um, for sleep, um, but it's something really nice. I, I quite like having um, like a combination of oat straw and passion flower in the morning if I know I've got um, like a really busy day and I'm kind of stressed that um, I'm not going to get everything done or if you've kind of got a number of different things to do and you're just worried um, that it's all just going to be too much then having kind of the passion flower and the oat straw just to kind of bring you down a level <laughs> um, to rationalize things can be can be really nice um, you can also this is the, the oat straw is another nice one um, which if you wanted kind of a stronger um, dose so stronger medicine um, you could have the tincture and that tends to be called um, milky oats tincture so it's made from um, the, the kind of fresh green oat flowers um, so a lot of the things I've kind of been talking about today have been um, we're sort of talking about using the um, the herbs either fresh or, or dried um, to make sort of teas or syrups um, but the tinctures are something you can look at if you wanted a, a kind of much stronger um, medicinal hit. So um, I've put on here um, just these are kind of some not these have got some other herbs that we haven't kind of talked about, but just some ideas for making different blends. And um, if you want to kind of start making um, your own tea blends, then the easiest thing to do um, is to start off just by mixing kind of equal parts of different herbs. And you can either kind of mix things based on their properties. So um, say if you want to make, um, so like the sleepy tea is mixing 
um, herbs that are all sedative um, or calming. Um, or you can kind of mix purely based on taste. So it kind of helps if you've maybe tasted some of the herbs individually and then um, mix them together to get a desired effect. So it might be that you like all the floral tastes um, or you like bitter tastes um, or you could do a mix so that you balance bitter with um, lemony taste or a more floral taste or more savory taste. And um, you can then kind of come up with combinations that you enjoy um, but also combinations that you might use for a certain um, time, whether that's when you're stressed or when you want to go to sleep, um, whether you've got sore throat. Um, so you can kind of customize things. And um, these are just some examples, and we can probably send these to you afterwards if, if you want them. Um, but it's I always say it's really good just to experiment um, with what you like. Um, also, if you want tips, you can kind of go onto the herbal tea section of our website and just, I always say this, like you can copy them. You don't have to buy them. You can just, you can copy what we've done. Not all of them are totally equal parts. There's a bit more, um, a bit more kind of, um, yeah, kind of, uh, effort or kind of care went into the, to blending them so that they taste well, taste good as well as having the intended properties. Um, but if you want some inspiration, you can look there. Um, and when you're making a tea, you generally use sort of um, one or two heaped teaspoons of dried herb per cup. And it's a good idea with herbal teas. If you want to get the kind of full flavor and the, the full kind of properties and benefits to let your tea brew for between 10 and 15 minutes. Um, and again, see what works for you. If you don't really like strong, bitter um like kind of really strong tasting tea then maybe you brew just for 10 minutes and that'll be enough if if you really like strong things then you can you know leave your tea for 20 30 minutes um you can kind of like brewing up your herbs in a teapot work quite well because then you can have you know maybe you pour the first cup at 10 minutes um and kind of get one sort of taste and then the second pour that you have will be um, a lot stronger. So you'll kind of get a, a kind of um, sort of full profile of diff the different flavors. And bitter is something we've sort of trained out of our diets um, to be a taste that we don't really enjoy or we kind of, um, yeah, don't have so much. But it's actually really um, good for our digestive system to have bitter. Um, so it helps to stimulate all our digestive juices and get everything kind of going. Um, and you can just use, yeah, for teas, you can just use boiling water, um, from the kettle. So, um, if you're having, uh, you have to be a bit more careful with, um, things like green tea and white tea. There's a lot more sophistication in the temperature of the water that you use, which affects things, um, like a lot of the antioxidants that are kind of what some of the key things in those, um, camellia based teas. So, um, which you also have kind of black tea from. Um, but with herbal teas and all the things we've kind of been talking about, um, just using boiling water from the kettle is um, absolutely fine. They're not as fussy, luckily. Um, one thing that you can do, so um, for some of these here that I've kind of recommended, you can, so you can make a tea just using boiling water from all of these. Um, if you were making, if you wanted to make a tea from some of the berries and um, any kind of roots of plants, so say if you were using echinacea root, um, or if you were using, um, what else did we have, or if you're using some of the spices like star anise or cinnamon, um, you get a much stronger taste by making something called a decoction which is basically where you um, put all your herbs and some water into a saucepan, um, bring them to the boil and then simmer them for sort of about 15 minutes. And it's just a more effective way of getting the goodness out of um, the kind of woodier parts of the plant. So the fruits and the berries and the, um, the roots and things you could, again, you can use kind of just boiling water, but you won't get as strong an infusion um, from them. And sometimes when you do that, you can, you extract a little bit more of the bitterness. 
Um, so something that you can kind of add in to balance that um, would be some licorice root, which is a kind of really um, sweet, kind of naturally sweet um, herb, which um, also is actually really good for your um, adrenal system. So another really nice thing um, for kind of when you're feeling quite stressed and your body's quite run down, as well as being um, nicely sweet. Um, so, and then the, the final thing that I always recommend um, for people to make at this time of year, and if you've been following us, you may have seen us talk about this, um, is something called fire cider. And this is basically, um, I'd say if you go away and do one thing to support your immune system and support your health or to make for someone else as a Christmas present, um, make this. <laughs> um, so this is basically like a super kind of infused apple cider vinegar. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll post in the chat a link to the recipe, which is on our blog for this. And it's kind of a combination of spicy, um, pungent, aromatic herbs. Um, and then you can, you might be able to read on this label, um, chili and ginger and garlic, um, horseradish, um, lemon, and th those kind of combination, th that combination of, um, sort of foods and herbs and things is one super super warming so um if you when you take this it, it warms up your whole whole body so really good if you're someone who kind of gets cold um quite easily over the winter or if you spend a lot of time outside um it also just kind of gets everything going in our body so it's really stimulating to our digestive system um and it's kind of really good for our immune system so all of these kind of combination of things are kind of antimicrobial, antiviral, antiseptic, antibacterial, um, antifungal. And so again, kind of help to keep our bodies healthy, um, but also can be used kind of, um, it can be used kind of preventatively, but also you can take it if you do fall sick. Um, so it's kind of uh, a recipe that um, the sort of fire cider was sort of coined by an American herbalist called Rosemary Gladstar. Um, but the idea of sort of infusing herbs in vinegars has been around for a really long time. And again, was something that um, used to be done in the past as a way to preserve um, fresh herbs over the winter when um, the kind of fresh supply is low because the plants aren't really growing that much. Um, and you can kind of make, um, if you wanted to make just a kind of herb infused vinegar, you could use things like um, rosemary and thyme and sage. And there's a story, um, again, there's very different different variations of the story depending on which kind of book you're looking at. Um, but there's a kind of story around um, the four thieves who were around during the plague in London um, and were kind of going around sort of looting people's homes, that people who had died and robbing people when they were sick. And um, they were sort of believed to be taking this four thieves vinegar, which was kind of an infused vinegar of lots of those aromatic plants. Um, and kind of that was the reason supposedly why they didn't fall sick. Um, so it kind of protected them against the plague, apparently. Um, so what you basically do is you just kind of chop everything up, bung it into a big kilner jar or a big jar, um, cover the whole thing with apple cider vinegar. Um, and then leave it to infuse for about four weeks and then you strain it all out and you can have sort of a teaspoon of it with some hot water and some honey. Um, you can also add it into soups and stews. You can cook with it. Um, and if you do fall sick, you can kind of take a few spoonfuls of it um, a day. And the apple cider vinegar as well is a really nice thing to have um, as part of it as a really nice anti-inflammatory. So, um, really good again if you kind of have a lot of joint pain or um, kind of inflammation associated uh, associated with things like arthritis. Um, it can be really supportive to that. Um, but apple cider vinegar on its own is also kind of a, a nice um, health food thing. It's kind of good for digestion. It can be helpful for blood sugar. Um, and th the reason why it's sort of used as well in this recipe is it's really good at extracting minerals um, and kind of the pungent flavors and all the goodness that are in, are in all um, those ingredients that we put, put in. So it kind of it just sucks um, everything out of those plants. Um, so, yeah, a really good one 
to try. Um, I think that gets us to the end. So I'm just going to um, turn this off so we can all kind of see each other. Um, so if people have got questions, I've just seen, I'll copy a few things into the chat. Um, in terms of books, um, conveniently sat in front of my bookshelf. Uh, so there's a few here that I really like. So I'd say this one, which is, um, this is a uh, Neil's Yard book. And it was kind of one of the first books I kind of um, got given about 10 years ago when I first started learning about herbs. And it's called Cook, Brew and Blend Your Own Herbs. If you just remember, it's, it's the blue one. And um, it's just really nice because it has like a different profile on each herb. And then the back is full of lots of really nice recipes. So um, and it's, it's, it's really accessible. It kind of explains um, some of the herb words and explains what everything means. And yeah, it's a really nice one if you want to kind of teach yourself stuff. Um, this is another nice one from, um, um, I think he's an American herb herbalist, Holistic Herbal by David Hoffman. Um, that's another nice one. Um, we, we are kind of trying to get around to putting a book list on our website, which we haven't done yet. Um, another kind of nice a couple of herbalists to follow, and they've got a couple of books, um, is The Handmade Apothecary. I'll put it in the chat. Um, they have two really nice books full of um, recipes for different remedies. So that would be another nice one to, um, to check out. Um, so I'm just, while you might be thinking about questions, I'm just going to paste a few things in the chat. Um, so this is just a link to um, one of our blog posts, which has the recipe for the fire cider and the rose hip syrup. And I think maybe a couple of tea recipes on there. Um, and I don't know if any of you are in Hackney, but um, in Hackney, there's a really great independent health food shop called, called Food for All, um, which is up in Stoke Newington. And that's a really nice place um, where you can go in and buy herbs and they have all their herbs in jars. So you could also, um, if you're trying to reduce containers and packaging and stuff, you can go in there with your own jars and pots and things and fill things up. Um, but a couple of other online, um, online places um, to buy herbs, but also um, kind of all, all the sort of herbal supplies you might need for making things are Baldwin's, um, which is kind of probably one of the oldest still going apothecaries in London. Um, so uh, you can go in there. It's a, like a physical shop um, right by sort of Elephant and Castle roundabout. But you can buy everything online. Um, and then Starchild is another nice sort of independent um, apothecary. They're based down in Glastonbury. Um, so, yeah, both of these places you can buy dried herbs and um all the supplies you might need for sort of making herbal things. Um, yeah. Uh, what have we got? When does echinacea flower? Um, so echinacea will flower normally um, some in the summertime, sometimes more like late summer. Um, so yeah, sort of anywhere, June, July, August time. Um, yeah, so if anyone's got any questions, they can feel free to write them in the chat box or if you want, um, I think you can probably unmute yourself if you'd like to speak. Um, or if anyone's got any, anything they'd like to share. Got any, any, um, any suggestions for places to forage in Hackney? Yeah, so um, we forage quite a lot around Hackney Marsh um, and um, all around there and kind of up through Walthamstow Marsh. Um, along the canals, it's usually quite good. There's lots of rose hips along the canal. Um, also, some of the more wilder places um, like Mabley Green, which is sort of next to um, kind of by Homerton. Um, yeah, even, but then also places like Springfield Park. Um, has quite a lot of stuff in it. Um, 
this kind of, as we go into winter there's sort of less less stuff to forage than there is in spring and summer um but you can still um you can still find things like the rose hips um also hawthorn berries um there's actually loads of hawthorn trees um in london fields park as well um yeah, normally um, what we haven't been able to do this year at all is um, we normally do kind of monthly herb walks where we kind of go out to these places and um, learn about how to ID, identify plants in the wild. Um, hopefully we can kind of do that again next year. We might try and disguise it as a volunteer session so that we can do it. Um, but yeah, normally we, we, do, we do that. Um, yeah, but it's been difficult to do that this year. Um, any other questions? I'm just going to pop in here for those who are kind of interested, just a link to our website. Um, there's also something that we kind of launched this year um, with something called the Herbal Journal, which is um, like a downloadable um, seasonal guide to um, using herbs. So there's a summer one. Um, there's an autumn winter one, which is kind of packed with um, recipes and um, kind of uh, things so we, it's kind of themed around growing and gardening and self-care um and stuff and they're eight pounds to buy um but that all goes to support our kind of community work um so yeah you can check that out if you want if you're interested in making a lot of things and you'd like some some recipes and our kind of um our um yeah top tricks and tips and things you can you can check those out <laughs> Um, we also share some I don't know some of you might be following us on social media but we do share a huge amount um, freely on there too um, if you do want to learn more about herbs we did a lot of videos over the summer um, so you can go and watch watch those um, if you want to learn more about kind of individual herbs um, and also using sort of um, doing more sort of self-care things so using essential oils and natural ingredients to make your own products Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions or um, doesn't have to necessarily be, can be anything related to a herb. If I can answer it, I'll, I'll try, it, try and answer it. <laughs> anything for bay leaf? Bay leaf. Oh, so you can put, um, bay leaf is quite a nice thing to put into your fire cider. Um, the other thing that you can do with bay leaf that's over there on the shelf is um, so another thing that if you wanted to use herbs more for skin care um, you can infuse your herbs in oil and um, one thing that we kind of do at this time of year um, which if you're interested in finding more about you can also come to an upcoming winter remedies workshop um, is to infuse um, make quite a strong kind of and again sort of anti um bacterial antimicrobial infused oil um, which we then turn into like a balm that you can use as a herbal vix um, so again it's quite a nice um, it's another nice warming thing um, you could maybe you could have it as a tea um, but yeah it, it works quite well in the fire cider Anyone else got any more questions? <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, we, we, we've got um, yeah, yeah, no, we've, yeah, we've got a lot to um, digest. Digest and well. <laughs> Not just her, Billy. <laughs> Mentally as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank, thanks. It's been really, really interesting for us. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, cool. <laughs> Bye. 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 Um, oh, we've got a question. What is the best way to dry the leaves or the flowers? Um, so you can either um, kind of leave things to dry um possibly so you can kind of just lay out your leaves and your flowers on a tray or 
Um, you can put them on a piece of like um, on a tea towel. The, the main thing you want to do is put them somewhere where there's really good ventilation um, and ideally wet, like not somewhere damp. Um, and also to dry them where there isn't lots of direct sunlight um, hitting them. Um, if you kind of if you wanted to dry lots in big quantities, um, you can also invest in a dehydrator, um, which is kind of like something that you plug in and is a very low um, temperature and has a like a motor with a fan in it. Um, we kind of use a combination of the two. We have kind of big drying racks, um, but the, yeah, the main thing is leave them to kind of to dry out. You can also use. Um, let me just grab one things like this which is um you've probably seen these these are like blue mushroom crates probably if you haven't seen these then you just you probably haven't really been out, out and about very much um and you can just put your usually line them with like a piece of paper or something and you can just pop your herbs in here and the nice thing about these is they're um i mean they're a little bit ugly um but you can stack them so if you're trying to dry quite a lot um, and because they're sort of like covered in holes, um, they actually work really well. And you can normally always find these kind of, um, they're what mushrooms get delivered to cafes and markets and things in. So you normally find them on the street. So it's, you can take them home, give them a good wash. Um, and it's yeah, a good way to make use of something that would otherwise kind of just be, just be wasted. Um, yeah, the other way is if you if you ha harvest things on a stalk or a stem, like something like rosemary or lavender, then you can also just tie a string around it and then hang it up. And that works quite well. Okay. Thanks again. <laughs> You're welcome. We'll see you down at the, the shop. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah if anyone if anyone is local we kind of um well, we've got a few more volunteer sessions for the rest of this year which are kind of all already massively oversubscribed um but you can go and see one bit of the garden um when the cafe which is called thingy cafe um in hackneywick is open you kind of you walk through the the garden to get into the cafe um, so you can go and have a look. It's not our main herb garden, our kind of herb gardens on the other side of the building, which again, you can walk past and look, look through the railings. Um, but hopefully next year we'll be able to kind of resume our normal program of events and get a lot of people coming to visit um, the space. So I think if no one else has any more burning questions, um, we can draw to a close. I'm not sure if um, if the Grow at Home team want to say anything or if you've got anything else coming up you want to mention. If they're there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming and learning about herbs. <laughs> Cheers again. Bye bye. Bye. Thank everyone. you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, thank you. Bye. <laughs>